Off a small exit in the middle of your long evening drive, you pull into a quiet, sleepy town, the kind with one main street and just a few lit street lamps. After checking into your hotel, you take a nice walk and eventually find yourself in front of a small brick building. What stops you, however, isn't the innocuous design of the walls, but the immaculate gold-plated door. And upon closer inspection, you see that it bears a small plaque with the title Memory Palace. Curious, you decide to enter. You quickly discover that it's definitely much bigger on the inside than on the outside, though the few people loitering around the lobby seem not to notice or to care for whatever reason. Taking a few steps forward, you see a man with blazing blue hair, piercings, and an outfit that have you mentally put him at some kind of punk show sooner than wherever this is. He takes confident steps at you and begins with, Hey you, my name is Sam Callahan, and this is my memory palace. You stand, befuddled. You know, a memory palace. Like, a place wherein all the work I've done collecting information about art across history can be placed and observed by anyone interested enough to come inside. He gestures to you. Which I assume includes you. Now come on, I don't have the largest collection here, but I can assure you that these 18 pieces will be worth your time. He walks off further inward. You decide to throw caution to the wind and journey onward with him. It's often best to start at the beginning, so what we have here to open my exhibit is the figures of a man and woman. Though we don't know the artist who created them, historians have said they were roughly created sometime around 4500 BC from a culture that existed in modern day Russia and Bulgaria. Until we were discovered much later in 1956, they both sat in a necropolis next to someone's grave in Hamangia. And I do mean sat, because unlike a lot of the early sculpted pieces, these two actually sit upright, with one figure even having a chair, which is pretty neat considering the time. Also, related to their sculpting, they have one of the earliest records of expressive faces for three-dimensional art, with some people even believing their expressions are pensive, and others assuming, because of their proximity to the grave, that it's a look of mourning. Sadly, with little to no knowledge of their culture surviving today, as is often the case, all we can go on is theories. And speaking of theories, you'll find more than you can count with this group here. Simply called the Group of Three Figurines and found in an island in the Aegean Sea, the lack of information on these sculptures has duped historians for centuries. What's even more strange is that there are accounts of hundreds of these all over the island, with many of them being destroyed next to graves, leading some to believe that maybe there was some kind of mourning ritual involved. For what my take's worth is that the figures were probably painted like the people being buried, as there is evidence of paint flecks on them, or at least painted like a generic person and then destroyed as a way of releasing the person's spirit and death. But as of today, we have absolutely no idea what their language is still, and it can't be deciphered, so your guess is as good as mine. What we do know more about, however, is the Sutton Hoo helmet, dating back to the early 7th century and presumably from Anglo-Saxon England. The design is usually what strikes observers at first, with the thought being something like, is that a mustache on a helmet? And you'd be half right. Rather, that's one theory that's being supported, but another is that in fact it may be a dragon design. Khan Academy writes, quote, Its tail is formed by the mustache, its body by the nose, and its wings by the eyebrows. Its head extends from between the wings and lays nose to nose with another animal head at the end of an iron crest that runs over the helmet's cap. Whichever the case, it was apparently quite ornate upon its creation, with bits of gold and silver gleaming off the solid iron and bronze base. When we discovered it, it was in a barrel mound alongside armor and weapons, along with silver dishes, bottles, and instruments, leading to the idea that it was probably some high-ranking person in the military, if not a nobleman of sorts. What is most interesting, however, in the find was the coins in the burial site, because they were from mainland Europe and alongside tableware from the Mediterranean. This shook the historical community at the time, which among other discoveries, led to thinking that the Dark Ages weren't so isolated after all. Now, before we continue past this gate, I want to talk about this creature here, called the Lamassu. It's not the only one of its kind, as there were a good few back in the 700 BCE days, but upon really looking at it, I want to know how it makes you feel. Safe and protected? Or maybe a little scared and confused. Either way, that's the intended effect from its creators. The story goes that the Assyrian king, Ashurnupial II, wanted these side by side at the gate to the city to both make the residents feel protected by this guardian being and ward off would-be invaders at the same time. And as a quick side note, if you look closely, you'll see that it has five legs, which may seem strange at first, but actually this was just the way that designers tried to work with the use of perspective at the time. From the front, we see two legs standing together upright, as if guarding what's behind them, but if we walk to the side, we see four legs apart that appear to be, quote, striding against evil. 
Moving quickly along, I now present you with Mankara and his queen, or at least, probably his queen? Now, while most people think the woman is Queen Kabernepity II, others think it might have been the Egyptian goddess Hathor, who was the goddess of the sky, women, love, and fertility. Yet still, some others believe that it may have been Mankara's mother, but since the inscription of the base was never finished, we just don't know. For my money, I'd say it's probably the queen, but the only reason that it's in debate is because if you look at her feet, you'll notice that both of them are taking one step forward. While that was normal, and in fact all but required for male statues to have their left foot forward, it was rarely, if ever, seen for a woman. Maybe this was a special request of the queen or king, or she is in fact the goddess Hathor, or someone else entirely, but it's a mystery for now. Now, here we come upon one of my favorite pieces, even though it is yet another piece with an unknown artist. Created back in ancient Greece, this one is simply called the Male Lover's Piece, and it's part of the bigger Tomb of the Diver collection. As the name implies, this was painted in someone or multiple someone's tomb, and the other parts depict a diver, which I'll get back to in a second, and other men and women hanging around. What's interesting about this part in particular, however, is the expressions and body language of the two men. At first I thought, well it seems like they're both together, enjoying a tender moment, but I later read an article questioning the look of the man on the right. They say he seems more apprehensive and that maybe the hand around the other man's head is pulling him away rather than pushing him forward. It's hard to say, but considering that homosexual love was more accepted back then, but definitely not fully, one like myself could argue that the artist intentionally painted this sort of nebulous state. Who knows, maybe he was painting his own feelings about someone at the time. And above them is painted the diver as he drops straight into the ocean, which was often considered a metaphor for death at the time, though Plato once said that, quote, death was not the end, but rather the liberation of the soul. Maybe the male lovers also represent a liberation of a sort. On to lighter topics, right next to our male lovers is the Idicula with small landscape. At first glance, it might not seem like much, but what if I told you that was the point? In a time where giant paintings and huge architecture was becoming the norm in a Roman Empire that itself was becoming enormous, there's a real sense of care put into the lack of things on display here. Being that it originally was on someone's wall, that makes sense to, an to a degree, but even then, the craft in carefully selecting what would be on display, in this case an idicula, or temple shrine. Flanking either side is Julia, the daughter of Augustus, and Livia, the wife of Augustus at the time. Of course, what memory palace would be complete without one of the Renaissance masterworks within? Men so talented, so influential, so well known, that they became the names of a bunch of cartoon turtles centuries later. Of course, in this case we're talking about The School of Athens by Raphael. It depicts ancient Greece way back when Plato and Aristotle were having some of the greatest historical debates known to man, alongside some other extremely important figures like Socrates, Euclid, and even Raphael himself as a cameo. Commissioned by Pope Julius II for a study in the Vatican, I can see why I felt chose to illustrate such legendary figures in history, being in the act of exploring their sciences and thoughts. Now, as we saunter along into the religious section of the exhibit, I want you to look overhead and check this out. This piece, which has no real official title, but is the portal for the St. Pierre Mosaic Abbey and was created in the early 11th century. And portal, huh? Seems like a funny use of the word, but that was the word missionaries used at the time when talking about a decorated doorway into a church or abbey, assumedly because it was a way to enter into God's presence. As such, these pieces of art often depict passages from the Bible, with this one specifically being a part of revelations that is referred to as, quote, the last judgment. In the middle is Christ, surrounded by, quote, four and twenty elders and four creatures. Since it was sculpted, there's a nice pseudo 3D movie effect as the people pop out of the back end. Before we get into the super full-on and Christian Catholic works, I want to make special mention of a piece called Christ as Sol Invictus. It was made back in Rome during the late antiquity era, and for what's fascinating about it is the man on the chariot has both been described as the Christian Christ as well as the pagan god Helios, and it's likely no mistake as the people buried in the necropolis where it was found were both Christian and pagan at the time, long before there was a major separation and hatred between different religious beliefs. From a work depicting the relationship between Christians and pagans to one of the most important works in early Christian art, we're here with The Trinity by Andrei Rublev. Created back in the 15th century Russia, it is said to have such importance in the religious art world that it is actually considered not just a painting, but an icon. Way back when it was made, the monks who first saw it said they loved it because it, quote, shows an ideal expression of God without God being represented. The Russian Orthodox Church also loved it for the same reasons, which had the benefit of people keeping it around, though the problem with that was with the original drying oil, the whole canvas turned completely black at one point. 
Since then, it has been restored a few times over, and the general agreement is that it's just about where the original color and definition were at the time. Of course, no discussion of religious works would be considered accurate without talking about at least one Renaissance piece, so here we have the Three Miracles of St. Zenobius by Sandro Bacchetti. It's known not only because of the titular saint who supposedly performed several miracles, including a resurrection, but also because the artist Battichelli had his entire life flipped upside down at one point. Going from being mostly removed from religion to an adherent believer, he fused the techniques he learned of linear perspective with color and new ideas of elongated proportions and the concept of painting people, quote, in action, showing a life lived in just a few steps and scenes. And of course, where there's religious art, there's talk of demons and devils and some great suffering. Such was the fate of St. Anthony in St. Anthony Tormented by Demons, which is of note mostly because of its method of creation. By using a technique called engraving, wherein the artist Martin Schroinger placed many dots and lines in little hatchlings, he was able to almost frighteningly create these vivid textured creatures that tug and pull at St. Anthony, all while he stares endlessly onward with an expression many perceive to be calm and collected. And bringing the violence to an all-time high is Artismia Gentileschi's variation of Judas slaying Holoferns. Now, I say variation because when she was younger, she knew an artist named Caravaggio, who created a work years earlier under the same name, but there are key differences that make her work different and equally as important. The most noticeable one when looking at both is that in Gentileschi's piece, Holoferns is spouting blood at an extreme rate, with the sword digging deep into his throat. Additionally, Judas herself and Holofone's servant not only don't shy away from the event as in Caravaggio's version, but instead lean into it. Khan Academy describes this work as, quote, two strong, young women working in unison, their sleeves rolled up, their gaze focused, their grips firm. Whether this was intentional or not, this was likely done with so much more intensity because Gentileschi herself was a female artist in a male-dominated world, and as such, she may have felt more of an attachment to this overcoming of the ruling party and depicted it more violently as a way of catharsis. Nearing the end of our religious section, we have Peter Paul Rubens' Elevation of the Cross. It was originally made in 1610 for the high altar of St. Walburga Church in Antwerp, and it certainly shows. Having just come back from Italy a few years prior, Rubens de demonstrates both his Baroque descriptive realism in regards to having parts like the shadows and some faces, but also influences from Michelangelo's statues and the men's muscles. Between that and the use of foreshortening to make the men look like they're going to come right off the canvas, there's a real sense that they're struggling to lift the weight of their burden. And for our final piece of religious art, may I ask you to lean down and see this almost tiny figure called a Pieta. This is one of the many that were created throughout Germany following a time at which preachers became disillusioned with the idea of Christus Triumphus, or the triumphant Christ who didn't suffer while on the cross. Instead, they began to speak about Christus Patiens, or patient Christ, who suffered like any other human being would. So, while some may look more violent than others, all of them are supposed to give the impression that in the end, Christ wasn't much different than you or I, and likely was in great pain because of it. These pieces have more recently been theorized by scholars to be so tiny, such that people could move them around to be used at a side altar or a home altar to be, quote, viewed by those in repentance. And here we are, with the self-portraits of Albrecht Dürer and Louise Viguet Lebrun, our final pieces for this exhibit. Now, I'm not putting these together to say that they aren't individually important, as in fact it's quite the opposite. Albrecht Dürer, when creating his third self-portrait at the age of 28, blew standard conventions out of the water. Rather than facing a three-quarters view and looking listfully off to the side, he faces front and center, daring you to look back at him. It's a power move, a choice so confident that was only used back then for depictions of Christ himself. This isn't to say Dürer thought he was Jesus. If anything, he wanted likely just to show off that artists need not be coy about themselves, that the artists possess all the power they want within their own canvas and can be seen however they want. Elizabeth Louise Vigée Le Bern, when doing her self-portrait, blew standard conventions out of the what? Wait, that sounds familiar. And this is because Vigée Le Bern did the same thing in her era, except when her portrait was shown off, it was criticized greatly for depicting herself showing her teeth when she smiled. Much like Dürer, she was fighting standard conventions of how one was supposed to present themselves even in their own work, and in Vigée Le Bern's case, it was doubly difficult because she was a woman. Even so, she continued to paint herself with that open smile, and while it doesn't show Dürer's outwardly strong confidence facing forward, she shows a quiet inner confidence, often painting herself out on a stroll with her child, or even painting herself painting. She wanted to demonstrate that she was nothing more or less than her entire self, and in doing so, 
like the works we've seen before, furthered the greater understanding and appreciation of the artistic medium. And with that, the man walks you through the hallway and back to the front lobby. By this point, everyone else has left except you two. Well, I hope you enjoyed yourself and maybe learned a thing or two from this trip. The world of art is ever expanding with new people cropping up every day, so keep your eyes peeled for them. He walks to the front door and opens it. Outside is quiet aside from the low hum of the street lights. With a nod, you take your leave and step out. You begin to make your way back to the hotel, but have this yearning sensation to say something to him. Yet when you return to the brick building, there is no gold-plated door there anymore. In fact, there's no door at all. Thank you for listening. This has been produced and edited by Sam Callahan.